Good morning to everyone. I am Professor Ibañez, and, and we are here to say the first words in this opening session of the Token World Conference. And I'm going to give the word immediately to our Vice Rector, Professor Mariano Ventosa from ICAI, who is going to formally open this session. Good morning, Mariano. Professor Ibanez, distinguished guests, participants in this conference. Good morning to everyone. I would like to welcome you on behalf of Comillas Pontifical University to the first Token World Conference in the context of the FinTech Observatory held by the ICADE Faculty of Law and its Center for Innovation in Law and the Lastria Association and Consortium. It is truly an honor and a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you today. First, it should be noted that the Consortio Reta Lastria is a Spanish private law association created with the aim, which today has become a reality, of being the main blockchain and distributed ledger technology community in Spain. With more than 500 associated institutions from industry, all economic sectors. Sorry. Uh, from industry, all economic sectors, public institutions, research and centers and universities. Second, we are very pleased to host this conference because, as some of you may know, since its very foundation in September of 2017, the legal domicile of Alastria has been situated at our university. This is a fact of which we feel proud and honored as well. Third, the relevance of this international conference on tokens lies in the novelty and significance of the challenging issues presented by the new token markets in social, economic and technological aspects, since they will imply a financial revolution in the forms of representation of wealth and in it is distribution. In the case of the European Union, the, this revolution has been conducted by the European Banking Authority and the European Securities Market Authority toward a marketing crypto assets regulation and it will have a huge European transnational impact. It was presented by the European Parliament and the European Council in September of 2020, and it is still being amended. Finally, I would like to express the following wish to you. We need policy and lawmakers, practitioners and researchers committed to leading the way to a sustainable and fair economic model. All of you are part of that community I hope that you make the most of this conference since token markets must be part of the solution and not a new problem for our society. I would like to conclude my remarks by wishing you an enjoyable and a very successful conference. Therefore, it is my pleasure to hereby declare the conference officially open. Thank you very much, Professor Javier. Ventosa. It's been a pleasure that you came here to open this token work conference and we are honored and proud that you share with us these initial moments. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. Okay, that's okay. And I would like also to thank uh, the Dean of the Law Faculty, Professor Abel Veiga, for being with us and share with us this World Token Conference. And I would like also to thank the Alastria team and in particular, the former president, Maria Parga, who was going to share these moments with us in the latest speech of this opening session, but she cannot because uh, unfortunately uh, her mother died tonight. And uh, she will be substituted by Jesus Ruiz, former CTO of Alastria, and a uh, person that is very involved and committed to the Alastria finalities and, and, and to the and, and pursuing the aims that Alastria has seeked uh, during the last three or four years. So we, sh we shall have uh, Jesus Ruiz instead of Maria Parga and he will do his best uh, to replace her and we are sure that um, it will be even more interested in technological aspects to hear from Jesus than from Maria. Anyway, 
um, uh, we strongly support Maria in this moment, and, and I hope everything will go uh, better for the future. Um, I will also thank Sian Jones for being here, uh, represented uh, the Mika Task Force team, and I would like also to thank the CNMV representatives we will accompany us in the latest session of, of this conference. Um, I want to thank you all for your strong support and to this event. And um, no more comments from me. Uh, I give the word to CN. Good morning, CN. CN Jones is the EU Commission DFP in the Senior partner, good morning. Good morning, buenos dias. Uh, muchas gracias. Uh, you speak very, very, very nice Spanish, I believe. Uh, I'm sure I do not, and you'll forgive me if I deliver <laughs> this keynote in uh, in English. Um, I may live in Spain, but I have a lot, a long way to go to learn your beautiful language, even if I live in your beautiful countryside in the Campo. De Thank you very much. Um, so I'd be grateful if you could confirm that you can see my slide. Yes, yes. We, we, we do see it perfectly. perfectly. Excellent. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. So I have uh, I have chosen a slightly contentious subtitle for my keynote on the future of investment tokens. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, address you with this opening keynote. I hope you will not be too disturbed by my by my contentious uh, uh, subtitle, but I have some uh, I have some good news, uh, and I have some bad news. First, the good news: the good news is that crypto is now part of the global financial system. Tokens are now part of the global financial system. The bad news is that crypto is now part of the global financial system because it even includes all the non-financial stuff and it's all being drawn into the regulatory uh, regulatory sphere. I'd like to focus perhaps on two areas uh, of wide scope regulation in this sector. You know, regulation is um, is really at many levels. It's at global level, it's at supranational level, and of course, at national level, certainly applied at national level. But over the last few years, there have been many developments that have drawn us towards uh, common approaches towards regulation. I've been uniquely privileged in that I've sat on both sides of the divide. I've been both a financial regulator, a regulator of what we now call virtual asset service providers, uh, and I've also had the privilege of working in the private sector, helping startups and larger crypto firms to understand what is about to um, attack them from the from the policymakers and the regulators. Let's look at, at two of these global regulatory developments. First of all, Mika. Now, I sat on Mika's um, task force at the International Association for Trusted Blockchain Applications in APA. And in APA, although it's an international organization, has its headquarters in Brussels. So naturally, it is very focused on European regulation. Mika is this new EU law for crypto assets. Its name gives it away. 
it's the markets in crypto assets regulation. And as a regulation, unlike, say, with NIFID, which is a directive, merely a baseline that countries have to interpret themselves, there will now be a single regulation applying the same rules across the entire EEA. The second and even more expansive regulation is that applied in the field of anti-money laundering, the countering of uh, financing of terrorism and the countering of the financing of weapons proliferation. And just in the last couple of weeks, the FATF has published uh, updated guidance on a risk-based approach to virtual assets and virtual asset service providers. For those who don't know, the FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, is the intergovernmental standard setter on AML. And its so-called 40 recommendations are not just recommendations. They are recommendations with consequences. Countries that fail to implement them, countries that fail to enforce them, countries that uh, fail to be effective in their technical application of these recommendations face the consequences of appearing on grey lists, on black lists. Just in the last weeks, we've seen both Denmark and uh, the Cayman Islands censured for their failures to uh, implement the FATF recommendations as they are now stated to apply to virtual assets and virtual asset service providers. And in Cayman Islands case, the implications are severe. Cayman Islands now appears on the FATF grey list and consequently it and its service providers face added scrutiny, enhanced due diligence, and a range of other measures that would be applied to those seen to present a higher risk. Well, let's look at um, what Mika, the European Commission's proposal for a new crypto assets law, currently going through its regulatory, sorry, its legislative process uh, as it is examined by the Parliament and by Council, as they pick through um, a very complex and comprehensive piece of legislation. It may take another two or three years before it hits the statute books, but we will find a piece of legislation that is all encompassing. Its aims according to the Commission, are to provide a clear legal framework across the European economic area to support innovation. Note, not to promote innovation, but merely to support innovation, to provide consumer and investor protection and market integrity, and that has to be a good thing. And of course, to support financial stability objectives but it regulates all crypto assets and all related activities. Every kind of token, all token issuers are brought within its scope. And it not only defines the rules or sets the rules for all token issuers, but it also goes so far as to say what must and must not appear in white papers, if you like, in the new generation of prospectuses. Meanwhile, the Financial Action Task Force, the global standard setter, remember, for AML, every country is in effect required to comply with its standards. It aims to set standards and promote the effective implementation of legal, regulatory and operational measures for combating money laundering, terrorist financing and other threats to the integrity of the international financial system. It exists to prevent and detect abuses of the 
global financial system uh, for illegal purposes. It too regulates all virtual assets and virtual asset service provider activities. Never mind the slight differences in terminology, whether we're talking about crypto assets or virtual assets, barring the nuances, we're essentially talking crypto. We're talking tokens. And it sets the rules for all virtual asset service providers. And it seeks to bring into uh, its rules um, everyone who plays a small part in the launching or operation of virtual assets. We'll talk more about that uh, later on. Now, lest you're in any doubt about the direction that is taken when applying these new rules, let's look at some of the Commission's own words. The Commission will, where necessary, adopt the existing conduct and prudential EU legal frameworks so as to continue safeguarding financial stability and integrity and protecting consumers and other customers in line with the principles of technical, technological neutrality and same activity, same risk and same rules. It's quite clear from this that the intention of the Commission is that it adapts existing conduct and prudential frameworks. It takes the existing rules and lifts them and superimposes them onto crypto. We'll try to work out during these next days of the Token World Conference precisely what lifting and shifting those rules may mean and whether some of these principles are in fact prudent and wise. Lest you think that maybe countries are a little bit more uh, circumspect, a little bit more um, thoughtful of the interests of the businesses and the citizens of their countries, uh, let's put that out of our minds. Just last week in a report of the Council's uh, working group on this MECA, proposed MICA legislation, uh, it's littered with comments that seek to reinforce that objective of applying same risk, same business, same risk, same rules. Let's just look at what uh, was said by the presidency just last week. It also proposed to amend a definition of the term operation of a trading platform for crypto assets, at least uh, a hat tip to uh, to uh, the system of crypto trading being a little bit different, to align or amend the definition and align it with the MIFID definition of regulated market. Wherever you turn in current regulatory proposals, you will find this tendency towards bringing everybody within existing approaches within existing rules. So one of those two commission principles is that of technological neutrality. I put to you that maybe uh, if you have to write some rules that specifically use crypto assets or virtual assets in their title, they're probably not technologically neutral. And no rules are really technologically neutral. They're written in the context of the technology at the time. And much of MIFID was written in the era of analog banking, or at least computerized analog banking, and not era of crypto assets. You have two paths to follow. You can either say, we take on board this new technology and we find new ways to regulate, or you take the view that you simply must apply the same rules over and over again. Does this really support innovation, new technology? Could regulation also be innovated? Maybe here's another approach. Sadly, one I'm afraid I don't believe 
that uh, policy makers will follow. But perhaps instead of same activity, same risk, same rules, the principle should read similar activity, same outcomes, new rules. We cannot escape the notion that decentralization is under attack if we're to see decentralization follow the existing rules, the same rules, then we're going to see uh, anything other than the reality or the goals that most of us seek when we look at this new era of decentralization and the potential that lies therein. Let's just look at some of the things that FATF has written in the new guidance, the updated guidance. These are specific quotes from that guidance in relation to decentralized services. Decentralization of any individual element of operations does not eliminate VASP coverage if any part of the definition remains in place. In other words, no matter how many elements are decentralized, so long as there's at least one thread that remains, then there's a VASP involved and the rules apply. For the purposes of determining VASP status, launching a self-propelling infrastructure, that's some interesting terminology. Launching a self-propelling infrastructure to offer VASP services, let's consider something like a DEX perhaps, is the same as offering them and similarly commissioning others to build the elements of an infrastructure, just pieces of that infrastructure, is the same as building them. It goes on to say that very few virtual asset arrangements will form and operate without a VASP involved at some stage if countries apply the definition correctly. The expectation clearly is that VATF wants countries to regard all virtual asset arrangements as having had the involvement of a virtual asset service provider. And in doing so, of course, to fall within the regulatory reach. Launching a, uh, launching a service as a business that offers a qualifying function, such as a transfer of assets, may qualify an entity as a VASP, even if that entity gives up control after launching it. Effectively, if you're developing a decentralized platform or a software developer and you have any potential gain from that activity from having undertaken that development or launched that uh, deployed that um, arrangement then you are likely to be a VASP you will not escape being caught within that grip Automating a system does not relieve controlling parties of obligations. In other words, the obligations of a VASP. So maybe we have to look at what is in store for us moving forwards. Whether from dogmatic belief in the apparently inherent fairness of the same rules principle or under pressure from market incumbents self-servingly reaffirming that fairness or uh, that particular form of fairness or simply from a lack of imagination in devising innovative regulatory approaches the outcome is the same crypto is now part of the global financial system and as a consequence decentralization is under attack if in any doubt, just consider some of what is contained in that proposed fat of guidance. Is that good or bad for tokenization? Well, that depends on which side of the um, crypto industrialization divide you stand. Let's consider this from alternative perspectives. A desire to make money from launching a token or by providing its underlying service or utility 
or from trading the token or simply from the conviction that the current system is stifling and perpetuates financial inequality. If you are industrial crypto woman, then you may loudly applaud anything that draws in institutional money. Something that looks just the same will likely calm the nerves of compliance man. He will stop uh, um, uh, having sleepless nights. Um, he'll draw huge comfort from knowing the rules that apply uh, to you are just the same as the time-honored rules he's known and loves. He can rest easy that he will not get into trouble for approving the dark arts of crypto and its token spawn. But if you're an ingenious crypto sister turned on by a never ending search to make things better, you're likely to be disappointed, angered even by this evolution. You will muster all your powers of ingenuity to prove it can be done differently. The lure of a Lambo is nothing to you. Going to the moon is, in your eyes, for astronauts. So where will this take us? Well, most likely, industrial crypto woman will keep warm and ensconced in the blanket of regulation. Its cost will matter little to her. Her investors, her customers, her users will cover the cost. Her crypto sisters, on the other hand, um, will head perhaps in entirely in an entirely different direction. Emboldened by the knowledge that the identity of her forefather, Satoshi Nakamoto, remains still a complete mystery, even after 13 years, or perhaps that's 90 plus years in crypto time, then she and her kin will develop anonymously. It's already starting to happen. They'll invent governance arrangements of unimaginable complexity and democratization. One thing she has learned is that crypto folk are an innovative bunch whose ingenuity is no match for unimaginative policymakers. She will make new rules. Over the next days of the Token World Conference, you may form your own opinion of my insights into, into the future of investment tokens. If you have been listening, thank you very much. Thank you thank very, you very, very, much. very, very much. much. We are proud, we are proud to have you here today. Have you here today. Have you today. Delighted to hear from your, from your clear, clear, making interesting keynote. Uh, which, uh, which we, we, we hope to publish, to publish very soon in our legal, legal. It's a new review, a new review uh, from that. Uh, from that. Um, um, eventually, eventually publish all the new version, extended version, version, extended version, of version of each at, uh, at uh, Reus, Reus, Madrid, Madrid monograph. monograph. I hope you collect you with us, us and we will be proud to, to have you there you there in, 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 in front of the front of like, like. Thank you. I shall be proud to submit my paper for publication. Okay, that's okay. okay. That's okay. And now and if now you, you, you wish to attend the uh, uh, next uh, lectures, we will be, be uh, glad, glad to, to have you here, have you here during the during the okay. okay okay lecture, lecture is on is on Ica regulation, Ica regulation. Yeah. Marcus, Marcus. still pending still pending and I'm so going I'm going to have that for the next 20 minutes or 25 minutes um, as uh, Sian Jones said before, European Commission is committed to and aligned with the aims of applying uniform rules and principles to financial markets, to participant subjects, to crypto assets and other objects of contracts, and to contracts themselves. It's very interesting for in the context of our university to speak on contracts because I'm a professor 
of contract law, among other subjects, and and it could be interesting to to get deeper into FATF recommendations, which shouldn't be dismissed at all by countries, as CM Jones said before. Um, I would like to outline that it's very interesting from the contract law viewpoint as a framework, particularly in all your references that you have made to VASP, virtual asset service providers and their status and their obligations. That's a, a huge challenge for all intermediaries, for all arising new intermediaries in the crypto asset market to comply with new rules arising, uh, which principles are quite much different from those traditionally established there in, in, in the in capital markets. Uh, in my speech, I will make three parts. First, I will uh, speak as a foreword on on Alastria uh, as an, uh, an introduction to to specific legal matters still pending, which is the second part of my speech. And third, I will outline something on um, jurisdictional conflicts and, and, and common general problems, legal problems still unsolved at both sides of the Atlantic Ocean in crypto asset regulation. So going on with the foreword, I would like to outline that Lastria is a private law association representing the interests of Spanish DLT industry, communities and network ecosystems and it has been recently highly interested in the development of the, of the digital finance package since the very beginning, as its legal committee members have recently outlined. The observable lack of consensus on a common poli uh, political position on legal matters in MICA regulation and other pieces of DFI regimes I think it's a positive fact for legislators and for industry, for D, uh, particularly for DLT industry, since it just means the presence of a diversity of interests, banking interests, commodity industries interests, startup technological industries interests, public sector and public administration's interests, science and research, among other. And they are all involved in the Alastria community. And therein arises the need to efficiently compose such interests. There is also no common position at the NATVA. Uh, I, I have to remember that INADPA was co-created by Alastria. As afterwards, I, I think that Jesus Ruiz will remember. And there is no common position in, inside INADPA on a lot of topics regulated in MICA by similar reasons, by the diversity of interests. Because of that diversity, uh, we should co-create a common alignment line to work all together to efficiently produce a common acceptable regulations for all implied sectors. However, Alastria representatives believe, and I personally believe that MICA contents can still be substantially improved not only by means of amendments, formal amendments, but in practice all over the next years. And it can be improved especially by means of cooperative efforts beyond MICA tax forces. 
In particular, commodity and security market supervisors and DLT industry should continuously work together for obvious reasons. I have to remember also that Alastria participated in the draft of INADVA's position paper and informed about the views of its stakeholders on a regular basis. The legal committee of Alastria has been honored receiving INADVA's MICA Task Force invitation to contribute and we have had an utmost enriching experience collaborating with the European Commission to improve MICA regulation, making it more industry friendly. It should also be noted that the INADVA, or International Association for Trusted Blockchain Applications, is not only a forum of experts, but a meeting point for DLT industry practitioners continuously saying on architecture. DLT architecture is very important because it entails smart contracts, structure and policies, APIs, decentralized applications and relay and related platforms to the different stages levels and layers of such architecture as defined in ISO and ITUT international standards such experience in my opinion should not be ignored at all by regulators Second, which are the specific legal matters still, still pending or difficult to cope with for the MICA regulation and for the MICA regulator in particular, in accordance with the September of 2020 version of the published text of the regulation? As CM, uh, outlined before, investor protection and market stability and market integrity also are the aims and the main finality pursued by regulator in general and particularly in MICA and in crypto regulation, how to combine these aims efficiently. Sian said before that <laughs> the decentralization is under attack. I can partially agree with that, but anyway, authorities should be aware that they should help DIFI to develop, maybe under proof of authority um, assumptions on the networks, maybe under the assumptions of other alternative DLT protocols. I don't know what, the, what mix of protocols should be more efficient to combine those aims, those legal aims. But anyway, investor protection is, uh, in my opinion, the, the north and the guidance line that we should pursue and pursue. Uh, to cope with the objectives of, of, of an international efficient regulation within this context. Let us see now, just on Title I, Title II and Title VI, some samples of the of specific legal matters still pending and problems still pending. A minimally mindful thorough analysis of all titles would take us several hours, probably as many as Mika Task Force sessions conducted within the legal group by Mr. Senafon Comturis uh, uh, very, very carefully and very um, efficiently too during the last month, during the third quarter and fourth quarter of 2020. I will start with title one. This title, this initial title in MICA regulation sets the subject matter, the scope and the definitions. Article one in particular, treaties on subjects encompassed. Encompassed. And it sets out that the regulation applies to crypto asset service providers and issuers, but 
are all VASP or crypto asset service providers encompassed within it, really? Let's think about auxiliary off-chain service providers or physical persons involved in crypto issuing, although they are dismissed by current regulation, by current proposal. Those are two samples of possibly non-encompassed subject. As I am concerned, there are no significant cost benefit previous analysis performed to clearly conclude, as Articles 3 and 41A seem to do, that physical issuers shouldn't ask permission for issuing or for their tokens to be traded on a Mika supervised platform. Another relevant question posed by a, detail, a more detailed analysis of Article 1 refers to the uniform requirements for transparency and disclosure of issuance, operation, organization, and governance of CASPs. Those matters are okay as they are uh, regulated in the proposal, but will the consumer protection rules and measures enough to prevent misinformation mainly on DLT architecture, as shown in International Telecom Union Focus Group group on DLT in 2019. I had the honor to participate in such working groups and legal working groups, and we, have, we will have also the occasion to host Mr. Alexander Chuberka to speak on all those related subjects. Also on behalf of the Russian Federation. And what about market abuse? There is no reference to cross-market abuses, which is an essential uh, matter in asset reference tokens on commodities, mainly on commodities. Otherwise, Article 2 poses questions, relevant questions related with the object of the contract. It, though it leaves aside financial instruments under MIFID regulation, and also it leaves aside deposits on deposit contracts under banking rules, which cryptos should be considered capital market instruments. Is Howey, American Howey traditional test relevant to this extent or not? Are classical tradability or ma massive negotiation requisites present in European national capital market rules relevant for cryptos? To what extent? Apart from this, is the, uh, the commodity versus security distinction relevant to this extent in similar terms to those posed by US Commodity Exchange Act and Securities Exchange Act regulations? And should laws like MIFID to be applicable to any financial regulated crypto characterized as security, considering the specificity of crypto platforms and underlying DLT structures and infrastructures and architecture. For me, this is a crucial point related with what Mr. John, uh, what um, Cian called bifurcation or bifurcation some minutes before. Article 3 sets out the key terms and definitions that are used for the purposes of this regulation. Beyond the doubt, on technicians of, techni of technicians and, and DLT practitioners on the boundaries of essential concepts, including crypto assets. There is another, another key juridical debate posed herein, and to me, it's, it's still unsolved. And it is, are all asset reference tokens a kind of stable coins? I mean, all of them. The same, the same question is posed, some query on other crypto assets like e-money tokens, 
which are often described in the regulation as stable coins. I'm not sure that they are all stable coins, nor all stable coins participate of such characteristics present in asset reference tokens. And within the realm of deserved supervision are significant, the so-called significant e-money and asset reference tokens limits. Are they relevant for investor protection, uh, protection purposes? Once more, a matter of dubious and unknown, unknown efficiency, since there is no previous previous sufficient uh, cost-benefit analysis post. And within the field of services provided, we have reasonable, still reasonable doubts on the presumably adopted equivalence of concepts set out in Mika. For instance, is a virtual asset service provided the DLT equivalent of, his, in, of an investment service provider under MIFID II? And can it be? I mean, from the viewpoint of the investor specific protection rules out of the scope of general civil private law or consumer rule protection. I'm not sure about that, about the answer. And from the viewpoint of private contracting, from private contracts, there are also other relevant subjects missed or ignored, just ignored by MICA regulation, like those tied to the private law qualification, nature, and subsequent private law applicable to tokens, like in the case, in particular, of UT, the so-called utility tokens, probably considered a residual and undetermined meta-juridical category beyond traditional service provided by professionals, what we call in Spain arrendadores, arrendadores de servicios, which are providers who locate or hire services for price in the sense of civil law. I always say to my pupils that most investment services contain no provision of services, since they should be repeated commission contracts or even barter or purchase of assets. So there is a mm, deficient or insufficient line of uh, definition coming from the MICA regulation, uh, coming, uh, sorry, from the MIFID II regulation that could be trespassed or passed on to MICA regulation. And uh, finally, Article 3 also defines the various crypto asset services. But is the list contained in paragraph O exhaustive and closed? The EU European Commission may adopt delegated acts, acts to specify some technical elements of the definitions to adjust them to market and technological developments. Developments, however, such specifications could become the rule and not the exception. Uh, now entering into Title II, I have to say that this one regulates the offerings and market of crypto assets to the public, what we usually know as IETOs or STOs, securities token offerings, and even uh, initial token offerings. Article 4 regulates uh, the general principles of the issuing. Issuers entitled to offer new cryptos or seek admission to trading on a DLT platform must comply with the requirements in Article 5, such as the obligation to be established in the form of a legal person for reasons of legal security? Why should they be always legal persons? It's, is it a matter of responsibility or of agency? Why not physical persons in particular cases? Many questions can be posed herein since specialized 
physical persons could better couple with such requirements. Maybe there is a mental remora not yet surpassed. The myth of the overall major trend to insolvency of personal patrimonies, such myth is even dissipated by the exemption of small STOs under 1 million a year. Definitely, there are substantial differences between crypto and security trading under the standpoint of primary with more clarity, secondary market regulation. But such differences have not impeded the transcription or a critical accommodation of many securities law pre-existing norms and rules beyond relevant protective market principles like transparency, full disclosure and responsibility inspiring Article 11. Such norms have been spread all over the text, including the references to prospectus in accordance with Regulation 2000. Um, 20, 20, sorry, 2017-1129. This is the prospectus regulation currently in force. Or the regime of white paper notification ex Article 6 to the National Competent Authority. By the way, which ones? Only capital market authorities or also banking supervisors? Or someone else in the case, in the case of particular sectorial asset reference tokens. Big question, big legal debate, many doubts on the actual competence of NCAs or national competent authorities to assess if or a concrete original crypto is or not a security. Difficult question to solve with a uh, without um, the support of industry experts. That is why the call to enact by representatives has been really important for the configuration of, of amendments in progression for the final text of NICA regulation. We uh, could also make some observations on Title VI on market abuse discipline foreseen for the, for the proposal. I myself suggesting, su suggested some amendments that were kindly accepted by, by Xenophon and, and, and Mika Task Force representatives in terms of incorporating the relevance of cross-market enterprise significance of market abuse in both cases, in, in the case of um, market abuse coming from um, inside privileged information and also in the case of market manipulation by contracting. We have to take into account that contracts can be manipulated easily, mainly at the first stages of trading, of crypto asset trading in the time posterior to the acceptance of the initial token offering. And those, the effects of such manipulation could be passed on to the underlying asset market. And the opposite is true also. Let's think about agricultural tokens or real asset tokens. But in the case, in the particular case of agro, agricultural or food tokens, tokens on food or some other relevant commodities for international agricultural markets, we could say that there is a combination of, effect, of price effects between all underlying and derivative market prices. And that should be taken into account when regulation market abuse, incorporating the possibility of trespassing and communication of abuses between both markets re reciprocally. That is why we incorporated such amendments uh, corresponding amendments 
in Articles 69 and 70 of the proposal. And uh, finally, I will make some short considerations on the common general problems still unsolved at both sides of the of the Atlantic in crypto asset regulation. First, I believe, I strongly believe that there is lack of clarity in current market rules and or ignorance of DLT previous relevant aspects in token contracting. For instance, on smart contract structure and function. This is, this is a technical matter which, which uses to be dismissed in financial regulation, not only in MICA, in the case of MICA, but also in United States uh, corresponding regulations actually in force. There is also a, a lack of clarity and, and even dismissing in other matters corresponding to the DLT network layers, mainly on protocol, on network protocol it items like the, corre the correspondence among the different proofs, proof of stake, proof of authority, proof of work, and other governing and ruling the network, and their reflection on market transactions, which we cannot forget that are doubly transactions on one side, they are transactions for commercial or financial purposes, for instance, for DeFi, DeFi purposes. And on the other side, they are transactions from the standpoint of exchange of data on a DLT network, on a decentralized system, posing relevant problems, as Sian said before, in the field of M AML, anti-money laundering and data protection regulations. Second, the inapplicability of rules on centralized market subjects. This is particularly re relevant in, in the case of central entities. Uh, which guarantee the position of contracting parties like clearing houses in derivative markets and, and, and in main secondary markets as well. This is the case also of central depositories and societies and, and companies dedicated to or devoted to, to, to the registration of positions. And also, in the field of investment guarantee funds, there is also a break um, and a rupture of, of regulatory aspects, not always sufficiently or complementarily well considered by the new regulation. Such an applicability of rules on traditional contracts is something that we should take more carefully into account for the future. Fourth, the arising of AML and data protection new, new legal issues like oblivion rights or, or other related to the blockchain transaction tied to the crypto asset session of property. And finally, and fifth, we should speak now about potential national competent authority jurisdictional conflicts. This happens in the United States between 
the Commodity Future Trading Commission and the Securities Exchange Commission. There are many conflicts of jurisdiction and the same could happen at this side of the, of the ocean between different national competent authorities like the Comisión Nacional del Mercado de Valores in the case of the Spanish market and the Banco de España as a banking authority and also in the case of asset reference tokens is the case of the other local, regional or national competent authorities dedicated to the control and supervision of relevant underlying markets. For instance, in the case of uh, live old tokens or wine tokens about which we will speak about on posterior days along this World Token Conference. But the matter on uh, jurisdictional conflicts is complex and long to speak about. So I will stop here. As a conclusion, I will take this one still many hurdles to be passed. Good luck, EBA, good luck, European Securities Markets Authority and Eurocom Commission representatives on your huge task, but please pay attention to DLT industry. Thank you very much for your attention and support, and I hope you enjoy next intervention. And next intervention is lecture two, short-term horizon for DLT public permissioned networks in Europe. Maria Parga is Alastria co-founder like me, um, and she has been president for the last, uh, the last couple of years, and she ceased to be president one or two months ago, just two months ago, and I'm excusing her attendance for the reasons I exposed before. And I would like from now onwards to give my word to Jesus Ruiz, who is also a board member of Lastria Community and Consortium. He's, he has been also the CTO, uh, technical chief officer, and he has been an Alastria representative, a huge representative in many European forums. So, Jesus, good morning. I give the word to you. Uh, I don't know. Oh, they show it? No. Sorry, can you can you confirm that you can hear me and? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, please start again, restart again, because we haven't heard the beginning of your speech. Oh, <laughs> okay. But in any case, uh, my presentation, you can see that, right? All right. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much, Javier, and thank you to all the audience. And this is a pleasure to to be here, uh, giving this presentation this morning. Okay. So. Um, you already presented me, so I will go direct to the presentation, if you don't mind, right? Okay. So, uh, let me start from the beginning, because in order to see a little bit of uh, the future, uh, you have to know where we started. And in 1972, uh, the first public data network in the world was put into operation. At that time, the networks were mostly regional or national before the, the development of the common protocols that uh, then gave rise later to the interconnection among different networks to become the network of networks, better known as the internet. The definition of public data network implies that any natural or juridical person without any discrimination or arbitrary rules can contract access to the network 
and use it for any use case that they want, according to the law, of course. But uh, which were the countries pioneering the public data networks? Well, surprise, Spain deployed in 1972 the first public data network in the world, six years before France, nine before Germany, and even three years before the US. Incredibly, that was done in an environment where the Spanish investment level in research and development was five to 10 times lower than the other countries mentioned. And I don't really think this has changed a lot, unfortunately. Uh, however, despite this and many other problems, currently the public administration of Spain is one of the most digitalized of Europe, just second to Estonia, as you know, and the penetration of fiber to the home is the highest in Europe. So this may be, or maybe not, the reason or one of the reasons why Spain has done it again. Spain has been the first in the world to implement a general purpose blockchain network, general purpose blockchain network with the so-called public permission model, trying to get the best of both worlds. First, a decentralized governance model, ensuring that anybody can participate according to some fair and transparent rules, of course. And then a permissioning system, like in the private consortiums of banks with banks, energy companies, energy companies, or in the networks dedicated to specific use cases like food traceability. But a public permission blockchain network is a network which is not controlled by any company, group of companies, or even by a single government. It's a network with the spirit of the internet backbone, which is also decentralized and permissioned. This is what we call the manifesto of public permission blockchain networks. Anyone can participate and use the network, and there are no artificial barriers of entry or arbitrary exclusivity or exclusion. Anyone can participate in the governance of the network, not just using the network, as in the first point, but also in the governance of the network if they comply with some conditions which are transparent, fair, and inclusive, and not if you have a lot of money, like in proof of stake or proof of work. Okay? So it's more democratic or should be. There is no anonymity for businesses and other juridical persons. Privacy, yes. Anonymity, no. Basically like in the real economy. Protection of the citizen and consumer is of utmost importance, not something after the fact and trying to solve a problem that we already created. And of course, it must be sustainable and helping the future of the circular economy, which is the future of all of us. The model is like a common pool resource, which is not controlled either by the state. So this is not a state control network. And it is not controlled by the invisible hand of the market. So common pool resources have existed for centuries, but they have been normally reduced to the management of natural resources and in a limited geographical scale for obvious reasons. But for the first time, the blockchain can be considered as a techno-social scare or limited resource where the principles of uh, common pool resources can be applied very efficiently by encoding most of the rules into the blockchain infrastructure. Of course, speculation should be taken as far away as possible from this infrastructure. And this is difficult, but this is the essence of a public permission blockchain network. And by the way, if putting together the words permissioned and decentralized seems strange to you, think twice. There is no real decentralization in an anonymous network. Think about the internet backbone. Think about the real economy, about any essential public service like public health, which is permission, public education, which is permission, or even the public roads of a country, which are permission, the plates of the cars, and the driver's license of the drivers. They are all permissioned because if there is a common good which is not infinite, so the supply is limited, it's scarce, and you need it to be inclusive, fair, neutral, and not subject to extreme speculation and dominated by the rich and powerful, then you need it to be permissioned and subject to the law. Now, in a real economy, 
Everything is important, but the special focus of public pension blockchain networks is on the real economy versus the financial economy. I can just put here, this is the financial economy and this is the real economy. The real economy is the part of the economy, as you all know, that produces goods and services rather than the part that consists of financial services such as banks, stock markets, etc. And it makes sense because, in general, the quality of life of Europeans is very correlated with the gross domestic product, the GDP, of the region, which is a real economy, and also with the efficient and transparent functioning of its public administration. The citizen, the families, the households are the center of everything here in the middle. Not the contrary. And especially important to the normal citizens, 500 million in, the, uh, in Europe only, are the arrows in blue that I marked in this diagram, which are critical for the well-being of the citizens. The arrows on blue, you can see, is the ones related directly with the product, uh, production of goods and services and to the income of the families and to the provision of services by the public administration. Unfortunately, one of the biggest problems we have right now is the growing disconnect between the financial economy and the real economy. In principle, the financial economy should be at the service of the real economy, at the service of the normal people. But lately, especially with digitalization, it seems to be an independent animal which serves only a few, leaving most of the people underserved in the real economy. Most essential needs of human beings are physical, not digital. If you don't eat, you die. The same with water, electricity, or clothing. People need vaccinations, medicines, hospitals, doctors, machinery, instruments, etc. People need roads, vehicles, boats, planes, etc. Can you imagine tokenizing everything and then following on the steps of the Bitcoin and skyrocketing the prices of all essential services? So we need both an infrastructure which is not as centralized as Bitcoin and Ethereum. You heard that. Not as centralized as Ethereum or Bitcoin. We need a really decentralized blockchain network. And we need tokenization to be at the service of the citizens. Okay, And this is one of the major challenges of tokenization. Its focus should be on the real economy and enhancing the quality of life of all citizens. It should not be centered on the financial economy in an isolated way. As I said, financial economy is very important, but the real objective are the citizens. And let me talk a, bit, a little bit about the real economy. Because a common theme in the blockchain space is we have to decentralize this, we have to decentralize that. But the real economy is already very decentralized and we need the blockchain to coordinate efficiently all the activities of many different independent and autonomous entities. There are 30 million businesses in Europe and billions of euros can be saved and productivity improved if coordination is enhanced, not decentralizing something, which also there are some things that have to be decentralized, but in general is productivity, reducing cost, and then uh, enhancing the services to the citizens. And if we speak about public administration services, it is also very much decentralized. Think about local governments in small villages. Decentralization is a good way to be in direct contact with the citizens and provide better services which are relevant to them. The real problem then is how to act efficiently and in a coordinated way. So we have two apparently conflicting goals. First, better services require decentralization, but efficiency and control require centralization. This is where really blockchain can help. Coordination of decentralized services. Uh, but as I said, the problem is general. Everywhere we look and scratch past the surface, we see coordination complexity that the blockchain can help reduce. Let me stress this. Contrary to conventional wisdom, the problem in the real economy, the one most important for people, as I said, is not decentralizing things, but to coordinate efficiently things which are already very decentralized 
and not coordinating, not coordinating very well. For each pair of entities interacting in the real economy, you see decentralized workflows between them, basically registering compromises, agreements, promises, certifications, etc. And with current technology, many things can go wrong because there is not a single source of truth and reconciliation and inefficiency represents a significant cost, both monetary and for quality of service. And the end customer, the citizen, is the one suffering and paying for all that inefficiency, many times with risk to the health or physical integrity. Think about food traceability or vaccination logistics in this pandemic or thousands of other use cases not related to speculation. For curiosity, you don't see payments in these pictures because normally the payment is performed several weeks or in Spain, several months after the actual transactions and interactions have taken place. And if factoring and confirming are used, the payments are among different entities that were not involved in the transaction. We can see that volumes of transactions due to workflows are much higher than the number of payments or actual asset transfers. And in the real economy, the real problem is selling, not getting paid. Trust is a key component of society and the economy. The lower the trust among participants, the higher the cost of transacting among those participants. The future is not going to be a single network dominating the whole world and for all possible use cases. The future is going to be a network of interoperable network, including centralized systems. This looks familiar. The internet is a network of networks. What we really need is the internet of value, which none of the current blockchain technologies can accomplish. And where public permission blockchain technologies are trying to, to serve, okay? At the top of the figure, the figure, okay? You see a blockchain network that is that sorry that the European Commission and the member states are building and putting in production this year before the summer by the way the network is called EPSI or EBSI for European Blockchain Services Infrastructure and main objective is to enhance the provision of cross border services including the mobility of citizens and enterprises but at the same time it will be a key enabler for the digital transformation of the whole European economic area and not just for the public sector, also for the private sector. Even though EPSI is a network of governments and public administrations, the new digital identity system will be useful outside of EPSI, especially by the private sector. And I think that in order to cross network boundaries, like I painted here, in a secure and efficient way, many independent networks will use EPSI as an anchoring mechanism to share trusted facts about participants in different networks. And the new pan-European blockchain-based digital identity system is going to play a crucial role in this interoperability. By the way, EPSI is another instance of a public permission blockchain network. Digital identity is the killer application to facilitate interoperability across different ecosystems and create a wider global ecosystem. We need a trusted common digital identity framework for natural persons, businesses, and also for things and processes or workflows. This is essential for an efficient tokenization system. Given that credentials flow mainly outside of the blockchain, so you don't register citizen data on any blockchain, the service provider receiving and verifying them could be in any part of the world, as long as it trusts the origin network and has a trusted way to verify the credentials. I have represented in this diagram a service provider anywhere in the world, which if the service provider trusts the origin network, any credential issued by trusted parties in this network can be used and consumed for uh, for any purpose by any service provider in any part of the world and this is how a network could achieve interoperability among applications in different networks this is an example epsi this is alastria in spain without connecting the infrastructure interoperability can be done via credentials or tokens hold by the uh, by the people okay 
So, for example, a bank in Spain onboarding a new customer using credentials for EPSI and other European countries without connecting the infrastructure or having the bank participate with a node in the network where the credential is generated. So we need a trust framework across the different blockchain networks. By the way, again, this is essential to any wide-ranging tokenization initiative to facilitate exchange of tokens in a compliant way and with minimal friction and without requiring that everybody has to be onboarded on the same blockchain network. At the end, this is the right way to describe interoperability across blockchain networks and their ecosystems and applications. Again, the important thing is that the citizen is in the center, controlling her data and receiving and sending her credentials from and to different networks. The critical enabler is that the networks, painted it is here, sat uh, should trust to each other, at least in the areas where interoperability has to be achieved, in benefit of the citizen, who, again, is the most important thing in the world. By the way, I have painted here uh, IPSI, which is the Italian Blockchain Services Infrastructure, is a public permission blockchain network launched just two weeks ago by the public administrations of Italy. And this is again another blockchain network which is national, complementing the European or the pan European blockchain network represented by EPSI. So EPSI is similar to Alastria, even though the promoters are different, but the objectives are exactly the same. And then you have here Lackchain, which is another public permission network promoted by the uh, Inter American Development Bank for. Uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. Again, a public permission blockchain network with the purpose of improving the lives of the citizens of the region. And then you have here another ecosystem, for example, this is in Slovenia. So it is up to the leaders and participants of the different networks and applications to enable this future, a future where identity, decentralization, and interoperability play a crucial role in facilitating the future. Tokenization is important, but it is just a piece of the whole puzzle that we all have to assemble in a collaborative way. And public permission blockchain networks play a critical role in enabling this feature. I really hope that this vision can become a reality soon. And thank you very much. I believe that you couldn't hear me. No, I, I, I believe that you can. Yeah, right you, now, yes. Th thank you, Jesus, for your wise words. And I agree with you in many of your propositions. Anonymity, no. Control for general purpose, yes. Privacy, yes. Let's say yes to what is uh, efficient and interesting in PDLs. Uh, that's the short term and I think also long term horizon, relevant horizon for DLT public permissions networks in Europe. Uh, we have to achieve a nice balance between decentralization and centralization. As Jesus said, proof of works could be really centralized if we create oligopolistic situations, and that's a true in practice. And it happens in China, and not only in China, and in other parts of the world. We know it very well. So let's get deeper into governance issues, because governance is essential to the development of PDLs. Um, another relevant thing I would like to say is that, this I say that on behalf of Maria Parga, Alastria is permanently focused on a collaborative development of public permissioned networks, not uh, we, um, under the principle of technological neutrality, uh, we try to develop uh, hyperledgers and BESU and other uh, quorum uh, and other networks uh, complying with the, that principle of technological neutrality. And uh, I think that the triple helix paradigm should be complied with also, uh, and university will help 
probably and presumably will help very much to fulfill the objectives for public administration, private enterprises and firms, and achieve the goals that Jesus uh, has just outlined before. And in particular, the development of a self-sovereign identity systems wherein Alastria digital identity uh, makes part of the trusted framework for have centralized and also decentralized uh, as convenient uh, purposes for industry. So self-sovereign identity is essential to the, the, the future development of tokenization and token markets. Thank you very much to all of you. I summon you for tomorrow round table one, which will be on tokenomics and token definition. We will have here Alexander Chuborkov at 16 hours, Pedro Mendez de Vigo, head of NICA Working Group, and as moderator, we'll act uh, Ismael Arribas as legal regu regulatory framework um, representative in several group of international standardization like ITU and ISO. Thank you very much to all of you and have a nice day.